everyone and welcome to the third annual Gentry Women in Tech Conference. It is presented by Siler LLP. This is episode number two. As with everything in 2020, a bit of pivot was required in all of this to bring the key elements of the Women in Tech Conference to you. So here we are. I miss doing this in person. I really do. That's how it's supposed to be. But there are advantages to this virtual format and access to so many amazing women. I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight in this special format we have. We have a terrific lineup tonight that is sure to inspire you, I promise. We also want to encourage you to watch your inboxes for invitations to future Gentry Women in Tech episodes. We have one coming up on September 30th and October 14th. So first, a heartfelt thank you to our sponsors for making this event possible. Our presenting sponsor, of course, is Siler LLP. Our gold sponsor is 181 Fremont. Silver sponsors are Morgan Stanley, Cooley, DeLeon Realty, and Harker School. And a big thank you to our in-kind sponsors as well. We've got J. Lore Winery and Vineyards, Four Seasons Silicon Valley, and Skin Spirit. Thank you all for supporting this important forum we have going on this evening. So tonight's program focuses on investing in future leaders. In the half hour ahead, we will celebrate and learn from an extraordinary group of women who have bucked the norm, forged amazing career paths, it's crazy, and founded some exciting companies. So first up though, it is my very distinct pleasure to welcome Kelly Bourne. Kelly is the Executive Director of the Cyber Policy Center at Stanford Freeman's Bogley Institute for International Studies. Kelly first earned a master's in international policy from Stanford, working around the world as a strategy consultant from Monitor Group, and then leading the Madison Initiative at the Hewlett 
Foundation. It is one of the largest philanthropic undertakings in America, working to reduce polarization and improve U.S. democracy. An interesting time. Kelly will be interviewed tonight by Gentry's senior editor and award-winning writer and author, the wonderful and fabulous Jennifer Pardini. Jennifer is coming to us live, lucky Jennifer, from the penthouse at 181 Fremont, our generous conference sponsor for tonight. So on that note, Jennifer, take it away. Thank you, Diane. I am indeed coming to you from this stunning penthouse. It's beautiful to see a clear day out there today and to be with all of you, including my good friend Kelly. Welcome. Kelly, in January, you took your expertise to the Cyber Policy Center at Stanford to build a prominent team of program leaders, 50% of them women, focused on the governance of digital technology at the intersection of democracy, security, and geopolitics. Back in April, at the beginning of the pandemic, I had the honor to interview you for our July Women in Tech issue and assess the field of disinformation, which you have helped to build, and the landscape of cyber policy in a year as challenging as 2020, when we confront this global pandemic, a presidential election, and increasing everyday tech consumption. Here in a January or September, like no other, I wanted to take the temperature of where things stand now. When it comes to cyber policy, what are the biggest risks you are concerned about going into the 2020 elections and beyond? Yeah, I think a, a lot of things are concerning right now. You know, I would highlight three. I think the, the upcoming elections obviously are foremost in all of our minds, and we are expecting a range of disinformation, both from foreign and domestic actors. Everything from polling places being closed in swing states to disinformation suggesting that the mail-in balloting process is somehow invalid to allegations that polling places have broken out with coronavirus and aren't safe to attend. So we have actually built one of the largest teams and collaborations in the field that's focused on addressing disinformation of this type in real time. It's a collaboration between the Department of Homeland Security's Cybersecurity Infrastructure Agency, a number of secretaries of state, and many of the social media platforms. So that is weighing quite heavily on us now, but I would say in addition to that, just more broadly looking at the changes in our information landscape and how Where problematic content has really started to undermine public health, uh, faith in institutions globally, uh, the general social fabric. So everything from racially motivated disinformation here in the US to the content that helped contribute to the genocide in Myanmar to what we've seen around COVID related disinformation that has really been ubiquitous. So a lot of concerns about just the new information environment. And then I think more broadly looking beyond even disinformation, just questions about how our global technologies are being governed and everything is gonna, I mean, my view is that that our digital technologies really are gonna be the driving force in the next century, and that it is gonna affect everything from economics to healthcare, to education and the environment, to our global democratic systems. And I think, I guess the last thing I'd say is that latter point is most concerning to me. I think within democracies, you're already seeing digital technologies being used to shift the balance of power between different racial or economic groups. And you have landlords using algorithms to screen tenants and police using algorithms to identify suspects and facial recognition technologies being used in that way also, or judges using algorithms to determine prison sentencing. So real implications for our, our sort of how democratic our societies are. And then I think even looking between democratic and authoritarian regimes, you know, we talk a lot about the artificial intelligence arms race. And if China comes out dominant in that space, what will that mean if they have dominant weapon systems, surveillance technologies, you know, social scoring systems, or come out, you know, economically dominant as a result of these technologies, I think we will be living in a very different world. So a lot, a lot keeping me up at night. Yeah. Sounds like it, I agree. Um, thinking back to our last election, 2016, what has changed really since then? Are we in a better place now? And what do you see as the top priorities for the field going forward from here? Yeah, a lot has changed. I don't know if we're in a better place. I know we're definitely in a different place than we were uh, in 2016. You know, and I had been working on these questions around how the internet was impacting democracy. You know, since before 2016. And so maybe we'd highlight three things. I think prior to 2016, you saw this sort of techno utopia where 
people were rightfully very enthusiastic about how technologies would improve societies and, and improve democracies. And since then, you've seen, you know, since the 2016 elections, a real shift in sentiment and this sort of backlash against technology, the so-called tech lash, where the public conversation has really shifted. I think scrutiny by legislators has really shifted. So that's quite different than it was before. Um, you know, second, we have a field now. Before you had a number of sort of disparate groups that were interested in these questions around the internet and democracy and tech governance. And now you have much more of a network of think tanks and scholars and former and current tech leaders and government policymakers that all really know one another and are collaborating to various degrees. Uh, and then I think we have much better frameworks for actually understanding the problem and potential solutions. So I think. You know, back in 2016, the conversation you often heard was we need to, you know, delete fake news. And I think now we're in a really different place where we're talking about not just, you know, true or false content, but content that is really biased in some way or, you know, racially charged or predatorily micro-targeted. And we're no longer just talking about deleting it because in our free speech context in the US, that's a really hard sell for many of these platforms. But there are other ways you can demote it, you can dilute it amongst, you know, more quality content, you can put disclaimers about who the source is. And if it's the Chinese state media, for example, and you can uh, indicate uh, digital literacy sources or provide that sort of in real time. So I think our, our understanding of the solutions have changed a lot. And then uh, to your to your question about what is needed next, I think you know three things are top of mind for me. I think we need much more transparency about how these algorithms work and what kinds of outcomes they are having. Uh, so more research to understand the impact of a lot of these technologies, especially on disadvantaged groups. And then I think much more, You know, we spent the last few years really trying to understand the problem, what it looked like and I think now moving much more towards solutions that are policy relevant and actionable. And so that's where a lot of our energy at the center is focused now. Perfect, picking up on that exactly. What makes it so hard to regulate big tech? <laughs> Everything. Um, I think, um, you know, first of all, I don't know, maybe, maybe four or five things. I mean, first of all, Right now, it's hard to regulate anything in the US. There's the degree of gridlock that we are experiencing at the federal level is, is really unprecedented. Uh, but then even if you could regulate much of anything, uh, which we haven't been able to, um, the tech companies themselves are some of the biggest engines of our economy. And there's this constant concern amongst regulators, whether it's warranted or not, that you know, regulation and innovation are sort of mutually exclusive. And then you add on top of that, that the big five tech companies are also some of the biggest lobbyists. They're, they are in the top 10 lobbyists in the US. Uh, the incentives for regulating tech, I think, are a little bit distorted. And then, you know, fourth, you have these massive values trade-offs. You know, we want privacy and find it hugely important. And we want transparency and accountability. And so there's tension there. We want free speech, and we want an accurately informed public. We want a diversity of opinions and viewpoints and perspectives, and we want a common set of facts, right? And so, you know, figuring out where you want to fall on each of those spectrums when many of these things are in direct conflict is tricky. And I think lastly, it's just the tech company's capacity to even do it. So if we could find a will and get Congress functioning and incentivize to do this and knew where we wanted to fall on these values trade-offs, you are then looking at tech companies whose algorithms are a black box, even to themselves sometimes. And so, you know, there have been many um, statements, and particularly in congressional testimonies, that uh, where the tech companies are saying that you know artificial intelligence and natural language processing and machine learning is going to solve these problems and just give them time. And then, you know, we hear from Twitter not too long ago that they could only identify about sixty percent of bots because it's an arms race, and as soon as you know, they can identify the bots and the bad actors change their techniques and it sort of never ends. Or with COVID, we, I think there were something like 240 narratives that had been officially debunked by the World Health Organization. And weeks later, you still saw 59% up on Twitter and 20 to five, I think 25 to 30% up on Facebook and YouTube. 
And this is disinformation that they are highly incentivized to take down, that is threatening to people's health and well-being. It's, for the most part, not that politically contentious when it's been endorsed by the WHO, and yet they just couldn't identify it and take it down in a timely way. So um, lots of different reasons why I think it's really hard to regulate these companies right now. Well, I'm glad that you're, you're leading the charge on that as well. In thinking about the conference theme of investing in future leaders, how does your work involve and impact women specifically? Yeah, uh, you know, this is an issue I really care a lot about. I spent, you know, some early years in my career in Africa working on women's economic empowerment. And then in my democracy work uh, at Hewlett that Diane mentioned, spent a good amount of time really looking at how to get more women into politics. We are now 83rd in the world in terms of women's representation in politics, if you can believe it. Mm. And so, yeah, I, th these issues are really top of mind for me. And I feel, as you said at the outset, you know, really fortunate to have a, a team of women leaders that I am working with. Almost half of our, our leadership is women. So, you know, I obviously am, am executive director. Maricha Shake, our policy director, was one of the top legislators in European Parliament before she stepped down last year to join us and really led the charge on tech regulation in Europe. Uh, Eileen Donahoe heads our program on geopolitics and democracy, and she was the former UN Human Rights Ambassador under Clinton. Uh, Renee DeResta, who helps lead our Internet Observatory, is probably one of the more quoted women in the disinformation space right now. And then Daphne Keller, who runs our program on platform regulation, was a top lawyer at Google and is arguably the world's leading legal expert on content moderation and intermediary liability. So we have a, a, really, a really great team of women to work with. And then, you know, in addition to all of the research that we're doing, a, a huge focus of ours is, is obviously on educating the next generation at Stanford. And many of the tech leaders that we are now working with came out of Stanford in many ways you could argue that you know Stanford had contributed to some of the problems that we're seeing in terms of how um, these leaders have been educated. And so I think getting women into these programs is a really important priority um, for us. And then, you know, as you know, I have two young, very young daughters. And I, you know, I, I deeply believe that the decisions that we make in the next, you know, few years about how we govern these digital technologies are going to have huge implications for the world that they are living in and how just and fair and democratic it is, how you know, economically or racially equal or unequal it is. You know, we just saw allegations not too long ago of Amazon having uh, you know, gender bias in their hiring algorithm. So you're seeing this everywhere. Um, yeah, so I think a lot about, about uh, future women and how this is going to affect them. As you know, I have two young daughters as well. So I feel better knowing that you are tackling these issues with your team of women leaders and your team at large, and I, I feel better about our future. So thank you for all you do and for being with us here today. Oh, thanks, Jen. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much. All right, thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Kelly, as well. The race and the regulations seem daunting, and I thank goodness you're taking it on. And Jennifer, one other thing, my daughter is a CS major at Stanford, so she's ready to take this on, too. <laughs> I'll get you together with her. It's exciting to hear the opportunities that women have now, too, right? Which is fantastic. All right, before we begin our panel, we have a very special treat for you. Our generous sponsors at 181 Fremont one of San Francisco's most spectacular private residence buildings, is letting us take a sneak peek at some of their phenomenal new residences, which feature groundbreaking display of painting, sculpture, and textile art by Black artists as well. The exhibition was curated by Holly Baxter and Associates. In fact, we have right now Tom Gaspar from 181 Fremont to tell us a little more about it. Hello, Tom. Oh, hello, Diane. Thanks for having us here today. It's great to be um, a sponsor. Uh, of this great event and everyone here at 181 Fremont is really thrilled to be able to support you guys so and to be amongst the esteemed company of your your uh, speakers tonight so thank you um, so 181 Fremont is a boutique building of 55 ultra luxury residences we occupy the top 17 floors of the building shown here on the screen and uh, the uh, Grand Pan House actually is the tallest residence on the west coast uh, each of the residences appointed with ultra luxury finishes that have been curated and selected from around the globe by Orlando Diaz of Adonis Studios. 
And today, uh, we're gonna give you a very first look at a, a, a virtual tour of our newest residence model, 61B. Uh, this home, the interiors were uh, appointed by uh, Robbie McMillan of Aubrey Maxwell and feature B&B Italia and uh, Max Alto furnishings. And then Diane had alluded to the uh, art program that Holly Baxter had curated. The, uh, the uh, exhibit will be with us through the end of December and is titled Podium. And again, it's 20 works by 15 prominent black artists from around the globe. So let's take a look. We hope you enjoyed that first peek into uh, Residence 61B. Um, it's really a stunning residence and the video can only really begin to barely capture that. So anyone who's interested in, in coming in to see Residence 61B or a, a deeper look into the world of 181 Fremont, we'd love to have you. We do by appointment. Uh, we're here seven days a week. And also keep in mind, the podium will be with us through the end of December and we are happy to arrange a uh, docent tour with Holly Baxter to enjoy the beautiful artwork as well. So uh, thank you for allowing us to present today, Diane. Thanks a million, Tom, and what an incredible spot. I want to go. Uh, I might get to be there next, next episode, so I'll hopefully get to see you then. And a big thank you to 181 Fremont for your support as well. So next up, I am so delighted to introduce two trailblazing women. First up is Ana Marie Huerta Franz. She is the Bay Area COO for SAP and has recently been appointed to the board of the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. Ana Maria started her career at Oracle in product management as the COO of the SAP Bay Area Labs. She oversees communication, employee engagement, and operations for um, about 4,000 people, give or take. <laughs> and just to make you more intimidated, she graduated top of her class from Harvard and then went on to earn her MBA at Stanford. <laughs> We're excited to talk to you, Anna Marie. And next up, please welcome Samira Khan. Samira is the senior, senior manager for global impact engagement at Salesforce. She works at the intersection of social impact and tech, focusing on impact management. And she earned her undergraduate degree from Stanford, of course, in management science 
Science and Engineering and her Master's in Public Policy from Harvard. So thank you again, ladies, for being here. And our theme is investing in future leaders, right? A theme which can be explored in just a bunch of different ways and different angles. Both of you have reached these key leadership roles in your careers. So it would be wonderful to just kind of start off a bit about your career journey. So Samira, let's start with you. What's your, tell us your journey. Yeah, thank you so much, Diane. So if I look back to my childhood, two key themes really emerge. One is I've always had this orientation toward nurturing. So not atypical. I was interested in being a teacher and a doctor and a lawyer, but all with an orientation toward helping each other and lifting those around me. So there was that aspect, but there was also this aspect of tinkering and creativity. And I was very interested in dreams and the subconscious and novels and playwriting. And I think what technology, especially technology for social good has allowed me to do is it's allowed me to really build. So I think when people think of technology, they think more about engineering as opposed to creativity, but technology is changing so quickly. If you're not sort of creative and innovative about it, if you can't tell good stories about technology and about society, you can't really have the impact that you would like to have. So I would say that that sort of backdrop from my childhood influenced me significantly in the career choices as well as the choices I made in terms of experiences. So after Stanford, um, because I took this particular class at Stanford called Ethics and Public Policy, I became very interested in the ethical implications of policy and how they can really shape the way society functions. And I was interested in the intersection of technology and well-being. So I went to the Kennedy School at Harvard and studied public policy and went deep Deeper. But instead of joining, let's say, the government or an NGO, as most do, I decided to go to Bangladesh and work with acid violence victims who are primarily victims of um, a hate crime or a crime done in revenge. And it actually sort of disfigures them. Oftentimes, these women are shut out from their communities. They're shut out from people they love. And I think that really was a transformative experience. And that is the point or the inflection point at which, in my heart, I decided that I would be on this journey um, for a career in, in social impact. And I don't think I had yet realized that my path would be technology, although I did study technology in Stanford. That came later. And I, you know, I think we'll unpackage that a little bit later, but it sort of led me on this path of, you know, going globally, um, you know, helping start a social impact practice in Malaysia for a large consulting firm. I then rolled up my sleeves and joined a social enterprise in DC to work on a platform to better connect overlooked talent for jobs. And then I landed at salesforce.org, which has been a great experience in being able to not only use an actual product, but to be able to use our entire platform um, that Mark Benioff refers to in, in saying that business as a platform for change for good. And this has really come alive uh, during the pandemic because we've been able to pivot what we were doing to really focus on how we can help our communities with our product, our people, um, as well as our culture. So I'll pause there. I, I love that. And we're going to get to the part about the Salesforce and what happened today as well. Um, thank you, Amelia and Samira. And Anna Marie, your career journey as well. Tell us how you got to where you are. Sure. Um, I think similarly, maybe my career journey started, you know, when I was younger, and I will say maybe the age of five, my dad asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I said, well, I want to be a nurse. He said, well, why a nurse? And I said, well, because women are nurses and boys are doctors. And he said, Anna Marie, you can be anything you want to be. And if you want to be a doctor or anything else, it's up to you to just go and do it. And Throughout my career, those are kind of the words that have always stuck with me. Um, I've had a very non-linear career. I thought I was going to go after Harvard uh, to be a lawyer. Um, I, actually, I actually ended up in logistics and operations. I was at a railroad for a little while. Um, and it wasn't really until a few years after college that I found my passion in technology almost by accident. Um, I joined Oracle when they were, you know, companies were just going on to the internet um, and doing hosted environment stuff, things that are bread and butter to us today. And that led me to a career at a dot com. And yes, I am aging myself, where I had the opportunity to go into a smaller company and really make a difference 
um, and see that company through a transition where the internet bubble burst and turned itself into an enterprise software player. I thought everybody goes to business school and the people around me had and you know went to Stanford and I really felt that I was, I really wanted to stay in the enterprise software space. I really liked the complex and the hard problem. And I've often gotten the question, you know, similarly to what was referred to before is, but you're not from a technology background. You know, how have you been successful in technology? And most of the time it's been, you know, sheer will to learn and to ask the right questions and build the right relationships and to sometimes see things from a different perspective. And it's so critical to have that different perspective and the business perspective these days. I landed my dream job at SAP, actually, which is a global company that, you know, when I started was 25,000 people. It's 100,000 people now. And I started in a corporate consulting role. I hadn't, I wanted to get some more strategic experience, um, but I wanted to stay within enterprise software. I had a great three-year stint there climbing the corporate ladder and then life hit. Um, I was married, pregnant with my first child, and my husband got a phenomenal job opportunity to move to Sacramento. Um, and if you've been in high technology, you know that that's a, you know, seems like it's so far away, but we made a choice and SAP was going to work with me, but we made a choice to change our lives for a while. I was able to come back to SAP seven years later, and those relationships that I started are the ones that, you know, brought me back. And I've been fortunate to have, you know, people say at SAP, you can have a lot of different careers. I've been fortunate to have careers across design, product, go to market, uh, customer success, um, as well as now the COO role in both local and global teams. So I feel very privileged, but definitely a non-linear path. Which I love, right? I mean, we've all kind of, we it, it's hard to go linear anymore. I think it used to be how it worked and now we've got to be willing to sort of see those opportunities too that may not be obvious to you. Um, so, so Anna Marie, you just mentioned sort of going to Sacramento and that personal journey of making that decision and how we do have to make personal decisions too. So I'm going to throw that out to Samir. I, uh, I'll set it up for you. You had, had just had your third child, if I remember correctly, and decided to move as well at a pretty critical personal and professional time. Yeah, absolutely. So I had literally just given birth for the second time. So I have twins and then another daughter. And I knew, as I mentioned all along, that it was in my DNA to have a social impact. I had been going back and forth to Asia, to India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Singapore. And I really wanted to help some of the most vulnerable communities across the globe, many of which reside in Asia and Africa. And I linked up with a partner in Singapore and I said that I'm you know, very interested in social impact. He said, I was at AT Kearney at the time and he said, I'm looking to start a social impact practice. The company is doing a lot of work, but we haven't brought it all together under one umbrella. So he invited me over to a conference that I still attend, obviously not happening this year, but it's called the Asian Venture Philanthropy Network. They bring together sort of enterprises from the ground and impact investors and funders together to really talk about impact and how we can deploy more resources and capital to impact. So I attended that event. I met him. His name was Naveen Menon. I loved him. I loved what he was doing. I went back and, you know, I had just had my first child. He's like, well, what do you think, since you're so passionate and interested in Asia, about coming over here? I think I had to respond in about a week and I discussed it with you know my spouse and he was in biotech at the time in the US and he basically was supportive he said this is sort of an opportunity for you a once in a lifetime opportunity and I was aching to go and I just basically took my three children moved to Malaysia um, I had been on my own had never obviously lived there with the family and kind of just set up shop and then started started working on these on the ground partnerships, started working very closely with Naveen um, and helped really start AT Kearney's first organized social impact practice. That wonderful story aside, I would say it was one of the most challenging experiences I had. <laughs> in a new country, um, starting something from scratch in a large company. So it was very entrepreneurial. So it was quite difficult and I could only do it really for a year, but it was an inflection point because it really put me on a journey 
to have social impact and to have social good. And since then, I've never looked back and every job I've taken thereafter has had an element of social good, social impact and entrepreneurialism. That is incredible. And talk about taking a risk at that point. And your, and your husband, you had a commuter relationship, right? He had to stay here. So you were there with the three kids. And that's, that's, it's just hard to imagine. But I, but I love that story and how it sparked your, the rest of your journey. And Anna Marie, back to you in this part about, you're, you're the, we've talked a lot about um, sort of our individual goals and how we've gotten there. But, but one of the things I know about you is that you're also a huge, you've, you've built many teams along the way, and that's been a big part of your career. Um, so I'm just thinking we've got one more time for one more question with each one of you. So for you, can you give us a takeaway of sort of like the three most important ingredients in building a successful team, personal life at the same time, but, but the team part of it? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so I think a few things when you're building a team. One, surround yourself with great people, different cultures, different views, different skill sets. Um, I cannot impress upon people how important that is and allow yourself to be challenged as a leader. I tell my team, if you're not challenging me, you're not doing your job. At the end of the day, I may need to make the decision, um, but that diversity of backgrounds and skill sets is, was what makes us all better. Um, and I find oftentimes that as I've built teams, I've naturally had a good mix of gender, a good mix of cultural backgrounds, um, and a good mix of, you know, racial and sexual orientation. And it really, really enriches the team. I'd say be your authentic self. That's the most important thing. Um, when I started at SAP, I was half German, half, uh, I was in a team that was half in Germany, half in Palo Alto. And I was often term, termed that, told that my boisterous California self was a little overbearing. And certainly some of that was good coaching as I was ascending in my career, but I also embraced that part of myself is my passion and that's what draws my success in leadership as well. And then finally, take advantage of unforeseen opportunities. Make the most of them. You never know where they might lead. Um, and maybe that's a little bit of my linear career or my non-linear career path, but it certainly worked out for me very, very well. I love that. Okay, so I wrote those three down. And Samira, how about for you, best piece of career advice you've ever received, and then maybe a piece of career advice you'd like to give to um, high school girls or even young women starting their career? The best piece of advice I've ever received is what's the worst that could happen? Somebody could say no. So I've been hearing it for a very long time and only recently have I really embraced it. I think being a woman, um, being a girl of my background and how I was raised, I often didn't or wasn't bold enough to raise certain ideas. So I think that that really speaks to this notion of using your voice, using your influence to really express your philosophies and what you believe in. And in tech, it's especially important because you have to make a persuasive case for a lot of the things that you do. It's about the elevator pitch. It's about the VC pitch. It's not just about the product. It's about business model change. It's about cultural change. It's about mindset shifts. It's getting people to actually commit, commit with their time, commit with their money. So if you can't make that case and you're too timid to go out with your beliefs, it becomes very difficult. So I would say the same thing to others. Um, what is the worst that could happen? Somebody could say, no, be bold, use your voice, use your influence and use it early. I wish I had used it earlier. Seems like both of you have used it quite a bit, but I love that. So thank you both so much. I wish I had another hour to talk to both of you. Um, but for now, thank you, Samira and Anna Marie. That was just an incredible little look into your journeys and, and what you've done um, so far in your careers. And on that note, I guess I also want to thank all of you who have joined us tonight. Uh, it was pretty special. It was quick, but it was special and great. And I guess my takeaways are be bold, be authentic, and take some chances, I guess, along the way, right? Those are sort of some of the ones that, that stick with me. Um, we hope that you join us again for future Gentry Women in Tech episodes on September 30th, as I mentioned, and October 14th. Please go to gentrymagazine.com and you can register there, plus read all the fun stuff on the, on the website. So on that note, I'm Diane Dwyer. Have a wonderful evening. See you in a few weeks for our next Women in Tech at the end of the month. But for now, good night.